welcome you on behalf of the Monterey Public Library. We do thank our sponsors, the City of Monterey, Kenry Row Company, Kenry Row Foundation, and the Western Flyer Foundation. I'm pleased to welcome today's moderator, the Education Director for the Western Flyer Foundation, Emily Gottlieb. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you, Francesca. Welcome everybody to week two of these discussions about Cannery Row. Um, we're very excited to have two distinguished guests with us, guests with us today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first guest, Greg Caillé. Um, Greg is a professor emeritus of biology from Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, um, whose specialty is in ichthyology and marine ecology. He's also the former president of the Cannery Row Foundation. So I'm going to pass it over to Greg for his presentation now. Thank you, Emily and Francesca. Am I on? Okay. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, be here today to talk a little bit about the natural history of Cannery Row, which in my mind is really the natural history of Ed Ricketts. Um, I presume that my slide is showing, the first slide. Okay, um, as you see, um, Susan Schillinglaw is gonna follow me, representing San Jose State University and the Western Flyer Foundation. She's gonna talk about the cultural history of Canary Row once I'm done. So my job um, is to do this. I'm going to discuss the natural and cultural history, mostly the natural, of Canary Row, but focusing on Ed Ricketts and his intertidal collecting. The intertidal collecting he did made him funds for his life, livelihood, and also gave him the opportunity to take data down on every specimen in every habitat that he looked at and collected from. He sold those specimens to various institutions and people. In the end, it resulted in a book called Between Pacific Tides. And he did this in his Pacific Biological Laboratories at 800 Cannery Row. If you want to find out more about that location and its history, the book on the left, uh, Michael Hemp's Cannery Row, The History of John Steinbeck's Old Ocean View Avenue. And there are pictures in it like this one here of the old Cannery Row aerial. Here's the Pacific Biological Laboratory in the middle lower. And to the right of that, and to the right of that are a photo and a statue dedicated to Ed Ricketts, and above him is a photograph of John Steinbeck, one of his very good friends. And the far right is the cover of Between Pacific Tides. Um, Ricketts concentrated his collecting in the inner title. I was um, a graduate student at UC Santa Barbara. I worked on deep sea ecology mainly, but I taught an invertebrate uh, zoology class as a lab, a lab assistant. And I used Between Pacific Tides as one of the textbooks in two of my classes. I came to Moss Landing in 1972. I'm still there, so to speak, even though we're closed, but I retired in 2009. And um, I have lots of tide pool experience through the classes I taught and co-taught in um, marine ecology. So that's a little of my extra of my history. This slide is to give you an idea of what most people think of when they think of the ocean. When you see beautiful scenery like this, you see beaches, rocks, the rocky intertidal, the water, sometimes sailboats on them, which I prefer to do, kelp, and so on. But the question is, do you ever think about the marine organisms below? I have, and certainly almost a century before, Ed Ricketts did as well. Now there are three words I'd like you to remember throughout my talk because they're essential in understanding how Ricketts looked at what he learned by going into the intertidal regions. He looked at the diversity of organisms that live there. He looked at their zonation from high to lower tide zones and their adaptations, how they get along in their environment, whether it's for protection, gaining food, coloration, um, those kinds of things. So those three terms diversity, zonation, and adaptations are critical to understanding where I'm going and how I'm trying to reflect what Ed Ricketts did during his short but powerful career. This is a slide taken from Larry Allen et al's book on fishes of California. And I use it for the main reason of 
distinguishing for you where the three zones are that I'm talking about. The one circled in red is the sandy beach or surf zone. The one circled in um, brown is uh, the bays and estuaries like Elkhorn Slough in our habitat. And the one circled in uh, green identified as RIT is the rocky intertidal. In any, each of those habitats, or the three main habitats that Ricketts covered in his collecting and in writing between Pacific tides. That book is distinguished because it focuses on the organisms and the habitats they occupy rather than their taxonomic level, which was new in those days. Um, it's now more common. And there are zonation patterns, remember the first term I asked you to focus on, within these habitats. So, for example, in the Rocky Intertidal, you'll see a slide later that shows the splash zone all the way down to the start of the subtitle or below intertidal zone. So that slide is to give you an idea what the habitats are that I'm going to be discussing next. There are several slides in a row that show the typical organisms that occupy these different habitats. This one is to represent the organisms of sandy beaches and the surf zone. Many of you are familiar with sand crabs, the shore crabs. If you sit on the beach for any time, you're familiar with beach hoppers because they hop on your blanket, your uh, um, towels and, and bug you a little bit. There are shore crabs. In the sediment, especially underwater, there are polychaete worms, there are sand dollars, and there are pismo clams. All of these are typical sandy beach surf zone organisms. Now, a lot of this was known before Ricketts, but he was the one who documented it in his book, Between Pacific Tides, as one of his habitats. A second one is bays and estuaries. And in our location, we have the, the bays at the, the mouth of rivers like the Salinas and Carmel River and Pajaro River, and estuaries like Elkhorn Slough. There are diagrams in the upper left-hand side showing you that these organisms primarily are in the sediment, but some like that bat ray and these fishes and some of the eel grasses live above the sediment. But you get things such as gooey duck clams. I know it's spelled geoduck, but everybody pronounces it gooey duck. I don't know why. Clams and mussels, oysters, and so on. And shrimps, amphipods, isopods, worms, gastropod mollusks, and crabs. The three on the right are the token slides for the, it, for the vertebrates in this talk. I don't really study any of them, but others do. And they're the ones that actually live on the water of this habitat and eat some of the organisms that we're talking about. Ricketts spent a lot of time sampling in bays and estuaries as well. So that's the second habitat. The third habitat is the rocky intertidal. And this is a slide of one of my marine ecology classes. Maybe it was an ichthyology class. Um, there's Gary McDonald here, and he was an invertebrate zoologist. But we were sampling at uh, Soberani's point, and we're looking at what organisms lived in the tide pools. We found the fishes, but we also noted nudibranchs, like the two on the left side pictures over here, and crabs and, an, and abalone, like the two on the right side here. And the interesting thing about the abalone slide is that it's accompanied by two cards, much like cards that Ed Ricketts wrote up after collecting a given species or a specimen of a species that he then cataloged back at the lab and he used all those cards with information on size, sex, um, adaptations, zones within the rocky intertidal or bays and estuaries or sandy beaches and surf zones and something about the morphology and taxonomy. He, he used those cards as the fodder, as the information for Between Pacific Tides, the book he wrote um, that made him quite qual qualified to do so. Well, Here's a picture of the first two pages in Between Pacific Tides. The one on the left shows an organism, organisms like <coughs> titans, which are gastropod mollusks. Gastropod means foot, stomach. And they also have eight shelled plates or valves. And Ricketts liked them a lot. Look at the diversity just on one page in his book. I found out by looking at the, in the literature that there are almost a, a thousand species of these worldwide. Uh, you need to remember that there's Ed tide pooling near Carmel in 1932 from Katie Rog Rogers' book, 
um, breaking through a photo by Ed Ricketts Jr., who was a fabulous photographer, by the way. And basically it shows you what he was limited to. There was no scuba. There was no ability to dive. You could snorkel, but most people didn't. There were no wetsuits yet, so it'd be cold. He spent most of his time looking at organisms in the intertidal zone above the low, low tide and collected them to see who lived where and what they did. So that's him tide pooling in the waters off Carmel. The rocky intertidal organisms of the three habitats that I'm discussing today are the most diverse, very diverse. And this picture on the upper right shows the zonation patterns. I don't know if you can read the words. I'm having trouble reading it myself, but it, it's kind of blurry. Subliteral, superliteral, midliteral, and intertidal. So the point is, as you go down in the water, the tides, the high tides, hit only the upper, middle, and lower, given the tide level of the day or that time of year. And on the left, it shows organisms that occupy those zones, um, shown are periwinkles, which are snails, barnacles, um, um, over here, isopods, sea stars, um, limpets, and so on. And to get back to the book, if you look at uh, Canary Row, if you look at chapter six, it covers the great tide pool. And in that chapter are mentioned crabs, starfishes, nudibranchs, hermit crabs, anemones, octopus, um, eels, which meant eel blenny like fishes that I've studied, um, snapping shrimps, limpet, and undersized abalone. There's a little vignette in there about one of his helpers taking some undersized abalones, which is really illegal. And he said, you better not do that. And he walked away with it anyway. But there's some pictures and in the lower left, there's a diagram of the diversity of organisms, including the algae in that zone. And on the middle, there are pictures of sea squirts and barnacles and sea stars. And on the right, um, more mollusks. So that gives you an idea of what the rocky inner tidal looks like <clears throat> off this coast. Um, Ricketts was also fond of limpets. There is an organization called Limpets that, that the late, great John Pierce invented. It's got an acronym I cannot remember, but it has to do with citizens monitoring the intertidal, citizen scientists. And they are small marine gastropods, mollusks, that are flattened, have cone-shaped shells, and a strong muscular foot. They live throughout the intertidal zone. They're attached to rocks, and indeed to collect them in the upper right here, this picture by Nancy Burnett shows someone trying to extricate one of the limpets, just like a, an abalone, from the shore. And this is in the Sea of Cortez. And the underside of it here shows the foot being pried from the rock and viewed upside down. The lower shot is a picture by James Watanabe at Hopkins Marine Station, which um, talks about one of the species, the giant one called Ladia gigantea which lives both in the Gulf of California and off the coast of Central California. So there are some organisms and some patterns that one sees when they talk about the rocky intertidal and the habitats and the zonation patterns within those habitats that Ed Ricketts studied. You can link also this to a couple of the other chapters, which mentioned something that's not marine like frogs, which you'll hear about later, and even a, a kid who was fishing for um, mackerel using bait from a carcass that was left from a doctor's office. There's a lot of fun stories in there. And you can read through those and find out that Ricketts spent a lot of time and had a lot of people helping him collect things like that. And like starfish, which were a really popular, popular item because the echinoderms were hard to get in the Midwest where these universities were. Okay, my last slide is to show you that there's other habitats below the intertidal. And when I give talks like this that are lengthier, it's where I go. I worked on the deep sea, I worked on subtidal habitats. And these are also very diverse, but in those days, it was hard to get to those places. Ricketts could only see these specimens when fisher people would bring him to him, or if he got observations from people who were um, snorkeling and looking at them uh, under or surface waters. Sometimes organisms that were brought in, like the fishes, would have 
these organisms in their stomachs. So they learned about subtitle organisms that way. But it includes sea stars, sea urchins, crustaceans like crabs and shrimp, and mollusks like scallops, snails, and nudibranchs and abalone. So there's a picture of the underwater habitats that Ricketts didn't get to study. He mentioned some of them, but not in detail. And now a lot of us since then are doing those kinds of studies. So there's my synopsis of the, those chapters in um, Canary Row by John Steinbeck, chapter six to 12. Chapter six and chapter 12 are the two that focus on the marine organisms the most. But there's a lot of cultural history there too. And when I turn off my slideshow, which I will do shortly, um, Susan Schillinglaw will take on this subject of talking about the cultural history of Canary Row, the novel, and of the place. Thank you. I don't know how my timing was, Emily, but. That was perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, Greg, for the wonderful presentation, for the photos. You really brought us into Ricketts world there. That was really fun. Um, so next, I am going to present Susan Schillinglaw. Um, and Susan, you're going to share your screen, right? Mm -hmm. I hope Perfect. So. Okay. Did that. You got yeah. it. Yep. Yeah. So Susan Schillinglaw is a professor of English at the San Jose State University, whose research focuses on John Steinbeck. And she also sits on the board of the Western Flyer Foundation. So I'm very pleased to pass this over to Susan um, to learn a little bit more about the, the cultural context of the book. And Susan is once again having trouble with... Um, so, oh, um, <clears throat> okay, so you can see it. Once Greg turned off, I, okay. Okay, you can see that now? We can see it, but it's not quite full screen yet. Okay. Okay. So if you click play from start, it should go to full screen. There we go. Now I can see it too. Okay. Uh, yeah, we had some glitches today, so thank you for being patient. Um, I am going to, um, you know, follow up with uh, Greg's wonderful presentation about Ricketts' scientific work. And, you know, the interesting thing about talking about Ed Ricketts is that there's definitely an overlap um, between talking about Ricketts and the scientific history and talking about Ricketts and the cultural history, because really he represents um, both. Uh, because he was such and is such a cultural icon now um, that he represents kind of a somebody who um, was both an ecologist and a man of ideas and he's equally i think revered um, for both parts of his um, identity and his character um, <clears throat> i just wrote an essay and called ricketts lab a kind of um, a landmark, really a place of pilgrimage for many, many people. And I think people come to Ricketts Laboratory um, as representing something really iconic in Cannery Row. And I also called it a cabinet of curiosities, um, which I think it is because it, it just contains so many, or suggests so many of the interests um, that Ricketts embraced. So um, I also have words to talk about the cultural and um, you know, impact of Ed Ricketts. So my words differ from Greg's, which is really, I think, you know, wonderful because we all choose words that kind of encapsulate what we want to talk about. So I want you to think about these ideas in terms of Ricketts. They are scientific ideas, but Steinbeck really integrated them into his own cultural um, books about the region and his own fiction throughout his career. But ecology, group behavior, cooperation, participation, and non-teleological thinking are words that I'm going to be going over in this talk, and they were both key to Ricketts thinking in science and in ideas and key to Steinbeck's thinking as well. I also want to talk about why living in place is so important to Ricketts, to Steinbeck, and to reading Cannery Row in its 75th year, which is what we're doing with this 
um, these presentations. And then today I got a, um, an email from the biographer, Steinbeck's biographer, uh, who uh, got a little um, notice in the New York Times today and said, there's a new biography of Steinbeck, because Bill Souter's book, he'll be talking to us later in this, um, this series. Um, and Bill Souter's new biography of Steinbeck is coming out right now. Uh, but the New York Times called Steinbeck a timely author. And Bill wrote me and said, there's no greater compliment that I could, you know, <laughs> that I could um, have right now than to know that I'm, that I'm discussing a timely author. So I want to say a little bit about that. So first of all, um, since we're discussing chapters 6 through 12 today, I thought I would start with chapter 6, where Ed, um, where Doc in the book and Hazel are collecting in the inner title, just as you saw on Greg's presentation. Um, and I think it's appropriate that the first time we really see Doc as a character, he is collecting. He's looking closely. He's doing what he does, which is collect inner title specimens. Um, and he looks closely. Um, and I think you have to, as you read this book, um, you really should pay attention to how many times Steinbeck mentions eyes or seeing or vision, because it's so important um, to understanding Cannery Row, the book, and to understanding Ed Ricketts, the man. Because Ricketts, the, one of the reasons that Steinbeck really admired um, Ricketts so, so greatly was that Ricketts' vision um, was broad. Ricketts looked closely as a scientist, he studied the inner title, and he looked abstractly as a philosopher, as a man of ideas. So it's appropriate that we, the book begins with him looking in the inner title and ends with him reading poetry. And that spectrum is really kind of what Steinbeck is trying to convey in Cannery Row, how all of us can look both closely and abstractly and live a full life as did Ricketts. Um, so I love this section and I think all of you should, after this is over, should reread the opening of chapter six because it's one of the most beautiful, I think, descriptions of the inner title ever written. And I just love it. Every time I read it, I, I, I see something else in that description. So open your books to chapter six and reread it. Um, it's also made into a sound, a song. So if any students are listening to this, you should go online and listen to um, Pipe Dream, the 1955 musical, a song called The Tide Pool, um, which is kind of drawn from this description, and then be inspired to write your own song. Um, I think another thing that this chapter uh, conveys about Ed Ricketts is Ricketts' concern with non-teleological thinking, what he called is thinking. Now, what, what Ricketts means by that somewhat clumsy term is that we should not focus on the end of things. We sh shouldn't think about teleologies or solutions, et cetera. We should just focus on, on life as it is, life as lived, um, which is sufficiently complex simply to understand um, the situation as it's presented to us. So is thinking is much less complicated than non-teleological thinking. But this chapter is full of kind of humorous references to non-teleological thinking. Um, like Hazel asks questions, but he doesn't really want answers. He just likes the sound of Doc's voice giving him sort of a recitation of ideas. Um, Henry, Henry the painter is mentioned in this chapter. Um, we'll later, there's a later reference to him as well. And Hazel says, but he never finishes his boat. And Doc says, well, he just likes boats. And if he finished it, he'd have to put it in the water and he doesn't like the water. So again, that sense of just keep doing, just keep making and creating. But if you reach an end point, you might not really like what the end point is. Um, and then the question about um, bugs. Um, why do stink bugs put their tails in the air? Doc doesn't know and says, I think they're praying, which is an answer that doesn't really solve anything or reach a resolution. That's just what Doc thinks. And they all kind of focus on just look at what is. Um, later on, Frankie, um, who is the young boy who adores Doc, said, um, you know, he drops all the beer in one of the party goers' laps and Doc goes to try to make him feel better, but of course he can't. And Doc says there's not a thing in the world he could do. And that is, again, acceptance of 
what is. Frankie can't control, he, um, he shakes uncontrollably, and of course, Doc can't do anything about that. So there's a kind of loving acceptance to Ricketts that I think was really important to all those who knew him, to certainly this book and why they want to give a party for Doc, um, and to his place in the cultural world of Cannery Row and Monterey. Um, here is Ricketts in his lab. Here's Ricketts, the, the entertainer. He attracted people to his lab. People had many parties there. That's why this lab has such a reputation um, and draws so many tourists to it. Um, it's described in Cannery Row, of course. It's one of the key locations on Cannery Row that um, Steinbeck describes. And he talks about it just exactly as it looked. The walls are bookcases to the ceiling, boxes of pamphlets and separates, books of all kinds, dictionaries, encyclopedias, poetry, plays. A great phonograph stands against the wall with hundreds of records lined up beside it. Under the window is a redwood bed, and on the walls and the bookcases are pinned reproductions of Damiers and Grahams, Titian, Leonardo and Picasso and Dali and George Gross pinned there and at eye level so that you can look at them if you want to. I love that detail. You can look at them if you want to. In other words, the art is not there just to decorate, it's to look at. There are chairs and benches in this little room and of course the bed, as many 40, as 40 people had um, been in there. Now this is a wonderful description, but it really captures um, how eclectic um, Ricketts' interests are. Um, Dolly and George Gross, as well as Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and so that kind of represents the man's mind. Um, here's the bed. Um, his wife, Anna, made this bed, actually. Uh, and you can see his books. And next to his bed is his record player, which only he um, was allowed to change records because he didn't want anybody to scratch his records. Um, so he had a fine record collection. So I think that Ed, um, as I hope my five words suggests, as Cannery Row suggests, as the, the um, ways that he, different ways that he saw the world suggest, that he is a kind of cabinet of curiosities. Um, a cabinet of curiosities is a wonderful term that used to be, you know, stores or play, rooms and houses or, you know, a part of a room that you just had, you collected things. Um, you just put in weird things that you like. So I love the term. I love the idea. Maybe because I'm a collector too, but that's really what Ed's lab is kind of represents as well as his mind. He has this kind of um, this very varied mind. And I think if you look at Cannery Row, in some ways the structure of Cannery Row, which has all these little bits and pieces that are gathered, the gathered and the scattered, as he says in the first sentence of the book, that's really how it's organized, kind of like a cabinet of curiosities. That's what community is, the gathered and the scattered. So the cabinet of curiosities really describes Ed Ricketts' lab, his life and his career. Um, going on kind of with the book and Ed in, in, um, in company, um, chapter seven of the book, I think captures another idea that's significant to Ricketts and to the cultural history that Steinbeck is concerned with, and that's group behavior. Um, in, 1934, Ricketts had just finished uh, an essay on wave shock and Steinbeck said, oh, you know, Ricketts thinks this essay will get him, you know, burned in effigy. And Steinbeck continues and said, biologists have been so busy looking at individuals that they have never considered colonies or groups. Now, one of, one of Ricketts' central interests, and I think that's why it was so interesting to hear Greg start with all those different um, uh, environments that interested um, Ricketts and how different they were, is because Ricketts really studied um, uh, group behavior or studied colonial animals in various environments. That's what made him so exceptional as an environmentalist and a scientist, that he was interested in groups or colonies. Of course, that's really what Cannery Row is about. And the bums on Cannery Row, this is Gabe. Um, this is a picture of Gabe and um, taken by Peter Stackpole. And um, this book is interested in groups. 
or colonies. It's in group, it's um, concerned with Mac and the boys and what they're gonna do. Um, so they are a little, you know, physical human group or colony, just as Doc is studying animal, colonial animals and group behavior. Um, when acting as a group, Steinbeck says, men do not partake of the ordinary natures of all. The group can change its nature. It can alter the birth rate, diminish the number of its units, control states of mind, etc. The group is an individual as boundaries, as diagnosable, as dependent on its units, as independent of its units, individual nature, as the human unit. Now, this is Steinbeck when he first starts articulating his idea of group man, which he develops in a book like In Dubious Battle and The Grapes of Wrath. But he's really interested in how when people form groups, they act in different ways, um, very different from individual personalities. And we see that, of course, today in various movements, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. When you have a group, you have a different personality perhaps together than you would individually. And that idea fascinated Steinbeck and fascinated Ricketts. And you see it in Cannery Row. Um, now, again, the, this whole idea of cooperation and groups, which was so important to Ricketts, you see in Cannery Row as well. Um, they, in chapter seven, Eddie works at Wide Ida's. Um, Wide Ida's, was for many years called Calices. It's right across from the aquarium. It was one of the three bordellos on Cannery Row. Um, it's now an ice cream place, um, but uh, when he works at Wide Ida's, that's where he is. And that's where he, of course, um, collects all the liquor for the whining jug, which is another kind of playful idea of, of you know, really kind of um, communal behavior or group behavior, all those liquors working together make something new and wonderful. Um, I think participation is another very, very important idea to Ricketts, to Steinbeck, and to this whole book, Reading Cannery Row. Um, chapter eight is about the Malloys. So suddenly you're taken out of Cannery Row, you meet um, this couple that live in a boiler, I um, put this little block on this picture by Bruce Aras to show you the boilers that were on Cannery Row, in fact, across from Ricketts Lab on Cannery Row. Um, and I actually saw somebody living in a boiler when I was, um, I was actually in, a, in Georgia, the former Soviet Georgia, and there was a man who was living in a boiler and I thought, whoa, um, indeed, it does occur. So the Malloys live in a boiler, and you know why is this little chapter a part of Cannery Row? Well, I think it's you know it's whimsical. It's another home building chapter, so it kind of connects to Mac and the boys getting together to create their home out of the palace flop house. And Mrs. Malloy wants curtains to create a home. So home is an important idea throughout Cannery Row. Um, how people create homes and communities. But I like the last sentence of the paragraph when um, Mrs. Malloy muses, men just don't understand how a woman feels. Men just never try to put themselves in a woman's place. Now it's kind of a throwaway line, you might not even notice it, but really that's so much about what Steinbeck is about uh, in this book and others. To really understand somebody, to participate, to have readers fully understand and kind of empathize um, with somebody very different from um, themselves, whether it's a female or whether it's a bum or whether it's um, Henry the painter who builds a boat and never finishes it. How can we try to understand others? And this idea of participation was so important to Ricketts. He kept saying that you have to participate fully in understanding the inner title. And Steinbeck also talked about participation and how people would fully participate in understanding um, his books, that you had to read fully and attentively and be engaged to understand people like Mac and the Boys or the Jodes. Um, Ricketts was, of course, an ecologist. Um, he said in 1945, ecology is the science of relationships. 
that's really a statement that could go um, underneath the title of Cannery Row, because Cannery Row is a thoroughgoing ecological novel. It doesn't really go anywhere. I mean, not much happens other than giving a Bahardi for Doc, but it's about connections, community, um, groups, creating homes. It's really about just looking at, and again, back to non-teleological thinking, what is Cannery Row? It's about connections. Um, and so I think that, you know, Ricketts as scientific ecologists, you can also use that idea to look about, look at what Steinbeck is doing in terms of um, community history and cultural history of Cannery Row. Cannery Row as a place is for him about connections. Now, in terms of ecology, Ricketts also said in his very first catalog, his 1925 catalog, something that I think is really interesting to understand his um, ecological sensibilities. Because when he asked Mac and the boys to collect 300 frogs, you think, wow, that is a lot of frogs. Um, and they collect, you know, many, many starfish in the opening section. So you think, is he depleting it? Um, there were, of course, larger numbers of um, many animals when he was collecting. But he, he was very aware that we must, above all, avoid depleting the region by over collecting. Um, and so he was aware of that. It was one of the issues that was current in the cultural dialogue um, at the first part of this century because many people complained, this was some part of the anti-Chinese sentiment, and they complained that Chinese were over collecting on the bay, over collecting abalone, urchins, and squid. And so some of the anti-Chinese sentiment that went along with this Chinese fishing village, which is where Hopkins is located, was that the Chinese were depleting the, the region. That really wasn't true, but that was some of the anti-Chinese sentiment. And some people thought that the village was burned um, by arsonists because of this concern with over-collecting. So I think Ricketts is aware of some of that and tries to kind of say, I, I don't want to over-collect and don't believe in it. And he did have Chinese help him collect, so I don't think that that was really that he thought that the Chinese were over collecting. Um, cooperation, <clears throat> again, that overlaps with group behavior and some of the things I said about Mac and the boys, but as the book moves outward, you see all sorts of little instances of cooperation um, that they kind of work together to help one another. This is a book that um, is a kind of a parody of capitalism in a way. Everybody barters um, goods to get what they want. You know, frogs are the currency in this book. Um, you trade off um, certain things you can do, gay fixing cars for what you want. Um, so I think cooperation, you see it in Lee Chong's grocery, um, which actually of course exists on Cannery Row. This is the only picture I know of the grocery, but you can still go in and see those, um, the those refrigerated shelves, well, they aren't refrigerated anymore, but um, to the back. And it was owned by the Yi family who came to San Francisco from Canton in 1914 for two years. Um, he worked between San Francisco and Virginia City, saving money, and then came to Monterey in 1918. And receipts for the first day were $6.75. The Yi family lived up upstairs and the operation was carried on by his son who was Chong Lee. So um, that's uh, just the cultural that is included of course embedded in the book in terms of the Chinese man who is teased by the boy in a cruel way and of course the store that really did exist. You also see cooperation when the Mac and the boys um, need gas for the Model T. Red Williams, who was um, had a gas station uh, um, in Pacific Grove, uh, of course fills the tank with gas, and Gay was an inspired mechanic and he makes the car work. Again, these pictures are by Peter Stackpole, taken in 1945, shortly after the book was published. But see, all these characters really did exist, so the cultural history of the region was embedded in Cannery Row. There is the Flying A gas station, which is not the original one, but that was the one that where um, Red Williams worked. 
Um, and, you know, when Gay has to fix the car, you might ask yourself, why is Gay an inspired mechanic? He's also the St. Francis of all things that turn and twist and explode, the St. Francis of coils and armatures and gears. Again, that's a kind of playful description, but it again points to sort of the duality of vision that you see in this book. Gay is an inspired mechanic. He works with his hands, but he's also St. Francis. Um, Mac and the boys are bums, but they're also the graces and the beauties. He's always asking you to look closely and look abstractly, again, like Ricketts. Um, and I want to um, end here. I think this is my last slide. This is a, this is a, pro, um, a comment made by um, uh, Steinbeck in Sea of Cortez. The design of the book, <clears throat> I have to, just a second, I can't, uh, is the pattern of reality shaped and controlled by the mind of the writer. This is completely understood of poetry and fiction, but it's too se seldom um, realized about books of fact. Now he's talking about that when he talks about Sea of Cortez, but it's also true about Cannery Row. And you could think about Cannery Row as a kind of fictionalized Sea of Cortez, because he talks about how what he's really doing is taking the, the cultural and the actual history of Cannery Row, the place, um, and making it, weaving it into fiction. Back to that um, chapter about the word. Um, and you take the word and the word turns what is real into a fantastic pattern. Um, and that's kind of what Cannery Row is. It's a fantastic pattern of Steinbeck sort of weaving together the stories of the region that he knew so well. So there's a lot of factual things. There actually was a flagpole sitter. There actually was a bouncer who killed himself at Flora Wood's place. There actually was Flora Wood, the madam who lived on Cannery Row. Um, there was a Gabe and Mac and the boys in the palace flop house and Red Williams, etc. So Steinbeck is incorporating the real into the fictional. Um, it was a book that was close to his heart. He starts the manuscript, which is at Stanford University, concerning the difficulties involved in writing an account such as this. And he ends it with the last chapter and how I dread it. So it wasn't an easy book to write. It was a hard book to write. And it's a far more complicated book, I think, than a lot of people appreciate. Um, another factual thing, Josh Billings really did die at the Hotel Del Monte in 1885. Um, my two last ideas were living in place, and I want to be, do this really quickly, so I'm not going to read all this. Um, this is really about living in place, about what it means to live in place and fully, um, fully embrace a place. Richie Lovedoy, a friend of um, Steinbeck's, complained about the cover of the original Cannery Row, the first edition, and said, hey, that drawing isn't really Cannery Row. That's some Eastern location. Doesn't look anything like Cannery Row. The, whoever did the cover doesn't know anything about California. And kind of saying, but Steinbeck did know California. So if you really want to know place, you got to read the book. You can't look at the cover, which is good advice for all of us. And then finally, why is Steinbeck a timely author? I love this. I love this um, this cartoon. I told you never on Steinbeck. <laughs> never poop on Steinbeck. So I think that he's a writer who deserves attention and certainly isn't um, is worthy of our consideration. 75 years after um, a book like Cannery Row was published, which is really an ecological task, a text that says something about community, about participation, and about um, depending on one another, etc. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, so just as a reminder to everybody, we're going to open this up to questions now for Susan and for Greg. Um, so I would recommend um, going into gallery view. So if you go into the upper right hand corner of your screen, you should see an option for gallery view. And then you can see everybody. Um, please feel free to raise your hand virtually as Francesca demonstrated at the, at the beginning, or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you or you can unmute yourself. Um, and we can also take questions in the chat. So I guess I'll start off with a question for Greg. Um, can you talk a little bit about Ricketts 
background in education. Um, he was interested in so many different things as, as Susan talked about, he was really into art and literature as well as science. So what was his education like? You gotta unmute, Greg. I'm not very good at this. I, I can't tell you dates and things like that. Although the people that I used to work with that gave tours of Cannery Row and of the um, Pacific Biological Laboratory know about it. Um, he was born in the late 1800s and he ended up going to college but never quite finishing college. And he went to two different universities. At the University of Illinois, I believe it was, he met W.C. Ali, who at the time was probably one of the first and foremost ecologists in nature. And he learned about habitats from him. He left college because he had other wanderlusts to deal with. He hiked all the way to Florida, did this, did that. Went into the service because he was just old enough to be drafted into World War I. And apparently later on, he was just young enough to be drafted into World War II when he was living in Cannery Row in PBL, in the Pacific Biological Laboratory. Um, I think he gained a lot of his curiosity about nature from Ali and from wandering through different habitats, both terrestrial and marine. So he really wasn't trained academically that much. He didn't finish college even, but he did find himself associating with professionals. At PBL, when he was collecting and selling the marine organisms, if he got stuck on identifying something, he would go to Hopkins and ask one of the invertebrate zoologists there or other people. And he would also write, he was um, prolific in writing taxonomic experts <clears throat> around the country and actually around the world and got answers by sending them specimens, finding out what the organisms were and used authorities in the field and learned from them. So I guess that's my answer to the question. I hope I've gotten there. You know, when I was, um when I was, uh, I had a sabbatical from San Jose State in 1990, I think it was 1991 or two, and Ricketts letters had just been returned to, sp stand st to Stanford's special collection. So mm -hmm. I spent a good part of the year reading all of his letters. And it's just amazing how many scientists the guy communicated with. Um, and he just, and this is after 1936, because his lab burned in 1936, so we don't even have the first you know, basically dozen years of his letter writing. He was just, I don't think the guy ever slept. I mean, he wrote essays, he wrote letters, he consulted with scientists, he, you know, had parties, he's listened to music, he, you know, had an active sexual life, you know, it's like, what did you do? Uh, and he just, and Ed Ricketts Jr. said he just stayed up all night typing. Um, so he was just an amazingly prolific and, you know, engaged individual. So um, interesting man. I had, there's a question here about what is the first book of Steinbeck's that you see participation? Um, you know, I think that was always, I think part of Steinbeck's empathy, which he, he grew up, I think, um, empathetic. I don't know why some people are more empathetic than others. Um, it's complex, of course, um, but he said when he was writing of mice and men, certainly that he wanted people to understand, the only purpose in writing was to help people understand one another, which sounds so simple, but it's just, to me, it's really a profound statement that that's why you write, you help to try to help people understand one another. And he said of the Grapes of Wrath, he wanted all readers to participate in the actuality of the experience. Of course, he wanted you to feel what it was like to be poor, to be on the road, to, to be unhomed. Um, and so his, he wrote a really, um, I think, um, powerful statement about participation, that he wanted the book to hit the reader below the belt. He wanted to open you up so that you could feel it. So participation was an important idea. to answer Don's question. Mm -hmm. Susan, there's another question um, in the chat. What was Steinbeck's, excuse me, Steinbeck's theory of group man and the phalanx developed independently, or was Steinbeck's theory of group man and the phalanx developed independently of Ricketts influence? Or do you think Ricketts influenced that? You know, a lot of people talk about 
did Ricketts influence Steinbeck more or vice versa? Um, certainly, in, Ricketts was a man that everybody was drawn to and Stein, Steinbeck was too. I mean, he had a really interesting, curious mind. And so, but Steinbeck had an interesting mind too. So I love his, Ricketts' sister said that they sparked one another. And I like that because it's a mutual kind of, you know, um, attraction and uh, creative uh, collaboration really, that one person would say something and somebody else, and they would respond. So I think they were both, um, better and more fulfilled and more creative and more productive because they knew one another. That said, the idea for group uh, man was grew out of, definitely grew out of science. And there's a quote I sometimes talk about um, in terms of Ricketts talking about colonial um, uh, uh, corals and that uh, Steinbeck read this. It was a textbook that was out of date that was published in the 1880s, but Ricketts read it when he was young and Steinbeck, they clearly talked about it because Steinbeck uses the same language to talk about group man as this textbook, this 1880s textbook uses to talk about group colonial animals um, creating um, uh, uh, coral reefs. So I think that it, was, it came out of conversation and Steinbeck took it um, when his mother was sick and kind of started thinking about how cells take over our bodies and we become a different person when we get, because his mother had a stroke. And then from that, he went on to think about how groups, and of course, everybody in the 30s was thinking about group behavior as the rise of Nazism, et cetera. But he started thinking about groups in terms of how it could be beneficial and destructive. And so you have both. So he got fascinated with that idea of groups and the behavior of groups. Thanks, that's really interesting. It's fun to imagine these conversations between, between Ricketts and Steinbeck. Yeah, <laughs> wish I were there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, here's another one from, coming in from Stephen Banks. So what was the reaction of the people portrayed in Cannery Row when the book came out? So Ricketts included, was there any sort of feedback from these characters um, who were portrayed in the book? Well, I can answer that one too. You know, I had a colleague who wrote a short story once that he read to the whole department and it was about me. And I can tell you, I was really uncomfortable as he read his story. He hadn't told me ahead of time he was writing a story with me in it. It was an experience we'd had together. And it taught me that you, if you're around fiction writers, you better be careful because they might, you know, put anything in a book. Um, Steinbeck called himself a shameless magpie. In other words, he just like took things. So I don't think people were necessarily happy. Um, some of them. Um, Ricketts himself said it was meant in kindness, although he was then sort of overwhelmed with visitors mm -hmm. at the lab. Um, and uh, some of the, some people said, oh, they left me out. And the bums thought, you know, why did he put us in? And, not, you know, so there were some grumbling about the book. Although, uh, Greg, do you have anything to add to that? Well, the only thing I can add is that when Frank Wright was alive, he knew Ed from the 40s when they were both in the service up at the Presidio. And um, one day, and Mike Gardino, one of our tour guides, and a great guy from uh, now at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, tells a story that when he came in, at that table where you showed Ricketts sitting with a, a cup of tea and a bottle of, of beer, at that table, um, there was a manuscript opened up and Frank started reading it. And he says, hmm, the title's kind of funny. It's Canary Row. I wonder what this is all about. And according to Frank, Ricketts came out of the, the kitchen. That's the kitchen door right there. And said, it's about me. The whole book is about me and you're not supposed to see it. So I think he was proud that he was the character in there, but I'm not so sure he knew what the consequences would be in the years after that because it became very well known. That's the story I have about that. Mm -hmm. Greg, I've got another question for you. Um, yeah. So you talked about some of the, you know, kind of constraints around Ricketts um, studies and marine studies at the time, like he couldn't, there wasn't scuba technology. Um, and so he was kind of working in the intertidal. Um, 
Do you think that if he were living now, he would be studying a different ecosystem or studying in a different way? Or do you think there was something specific about the intertidal that really drew him there? I think the main thing is that the intertidal was accessible. And he studied every one of those habitats, not just in Monterey Bay, but up and down the coast. Mm -hmm. um, Michael Hemp is now studying all of Ricketts activities up in the Puget Sound in the Pacific Northwest, where he spent a lot of his time. They did the Sea of Cortez expedition too. In all those cases, it was intertidal because that's the only place they could get to and really see and collect. But if he were alive now, he'd be doing what the rest of the marine ecologists of this world are doing, observing with scuba, doing transects, doing repeated transects over time, which is something Ricketts really didn't do because he didn't have that much time. He accomplished an amazing amount in a short period. The amazing thing is that he covered most of the diversity of the Rocky and intertidal and the other parts of the shoreline in that book in just maybe three decades. And he, like Susan said, he must have worked all the time. He was not a partier and a drinker all the time, I can tell you that. And, you know, the people at, at Hopkins Marine's uh, uh, lab in the library, Donald Coors, has a lot of those records. And you just go look at all the details that he wrote in there by hand, by typewriter. It was phenomenal. I mean, he was a cataloger. He knew what he was doing. He was keeping things organized, mostly in his mind, but also in writing. So he had a chance to do it. It might have been a push for him to go subtitle, but boy, everybody else since then has done that and used his habitat approach. John Pierce, actually, when I first started teaching at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, had a little mimeograph, that's how old I am, and that I handed out to class. It was called the Kelp Bed as a Classroom. Hmm. So he was sort of a later day Ed Ricketts because he looked at diving in kelp beds to figure out how organisms did everything to each other, just like Susan said, that Ed and John talked about. So it's a, mat a natural progression. And uh, the deep sea is another example. Now people can go into submersibles. People at Mabari can use remotely operated vehicles and get to thousands of meters, more than thousands of feet, and look at organisms. In, in the case of Mabari, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, they can tag something down there and get to it repeatedly. And so they can monitor the growth of an individual clam or muscle. So things have changed and technology has helped drive that. Absolutely. <clears throat> For that, it is really remarkable to think of all he accomplished in his life. It really is amazing. Yeah. Susan, there's another question um, in the chat, um, not just about Cannery Row, but all of Steinbeck. Um, why do you think he chose to embark on a writing career? And did he have a specific motive in writing? Uh, well, I think he always loved reading first. And I think a lot of writers like to read. Um, he read a lot, you know, his, um, he was encouraged to read as a child um, and go to the library. His mother was very, um, eager to have all of her children well-educated. And so uh, that was part of it. Uh, he was given um, the boys King Arthur when he was nine and he just loved King Arthur. And I, I think that's a window into why he wanted to write because what he loved about the King Arthur stories was the language. He loved the words, the sound of the archaic words. And he and his sister, his younger sister Mary used to pretend they were knights and squires below pastures of heaven the the cliffs and the pastures of heaven and i think it was just the sound of language and the just words and he used to write poetry to all of his family when he was young he'd write write these kind of ornate poems he has a wonderful poem um, about his mother playing bridge and gossiping when that he wrote when he was about nine so i you know so at first he was a poet and then he decided when he was about 14 which is pretty young. I mean, how many people decide in junior high what you want to do, that he was going to be a writer. And that was, you know, um, you know, that was ambitious. He didn't make any money as a writer until 15 years later. So it was all he ever wanted to do was to write. And of course he wanted an audience, but he was also kind of wary about an audience because if he thought it became too, too 
famous that he'd become egotistical or he'd be aware of his ego and not be able to write. Um, but he just liked putting words on paper. I mean, I think if you read that section that I suggested, the, the tide pool, the description of the tide pool, it's just beautiful. It's just, it's like he loves a word like nudibranch. I mean, it's a beautiful word, you know? And so he just uses the words of the intertidal specimens because they're complicated and they sound lovely. So, and I think that's true all of his career. Um, he once also said, by the way, he played a game called Dictionary. And he said, I know so many words and I use so few of them, which is probably good advice for anybody who wants to be a writer. You know, don't try to impress with words, try to, try to express, you know, something that everyone can understand. And I, I think that's, that was important to him. Wonderful. Um, another question from Stephen Banks. Um, did Ricketts, so Ricketts was this kind of recurring character um, in a lot of Steinbeck's work. Did he react to his portrayal in Grapes of Wrath or in Dubious Battle or in, um, or in Moon is Down? Was there any kind of documented reaction to those, those characters? No, I don't know of any references to Ricketts saying anything about other characters. That's critics and people commenting on Steinbeck who say there's a kind of Ricketts light character in many of his books. And I think there is. I mean, some people also call it a Merlin character back to the Arthurian tale. Some call it a self character like Steinbeck, this is who I wish I were. And the person I wish I were is very much like Ricketts. So I wish I were like my best friend Ricketts, you know, how we all kind of wish we could erase our less attractive characteristics. Um, and so it could be a self character, it could be a Ricketts character, it could be a Merlin character, but what the character is like Jim Casey or Doc Brent, when all those characters, they see broadly, they look at a situation, try to accept it as it is. So they have many of the characteristics that Ricketts portrays, understanding, you know, acceptance, um, tolerance, um, et cetera. Ricketts is a kind of ideal other for Steinbeck, like a soulmate too. Romantic poets are always looking for their soulmates, somebody who was just kind of like them and expressed the, this ideal person who completed them. And that's what Ricketts was for Steinbeck. Do you think that Steinbeck was that for Ricketts as well? Um, I think that, I think yes. I think in many ways Steinbeck was, a very, very close friend, but Ricketts had other close friends. Um, Jim Fitzgerald, who was a painter, um, was a very close friend of Ricketts early on. And his sister said that Jim Fitzgerald was almost as close to, to Ricketts as Steinbeck was. But I think that given the number of letters they wrote to one another and how much they poured their hearts out to one another, I think probably Steinbeck was that to Ricketts as well. Wonderful. Any other questions from the participants that I might be missing? Feel free to, to raise your hand or unmute yourself. Jerry, go ahead. Um, so according to researcher Don Kors, who's also uh, um, a, a listening in, uh, he had sent me information about uh, Ed Ricketts uh, coming to my grandfather's house uh, uh, for Chinese New Year's. And it sort of surprises me because as you uh, talk about how busy he is and all the things he's, he's been doing, that um, he could find the time to come to Chinese New Year's at my grandfather's house, which is the Wave Street Studios house now. Um, does that surprise you? If I were invited to Chinese New Year's, I would, come, I would certainly go. <laughs> I think... <laughs> I, I think Ricketts was curious and accepting and, you know, he probably was honored to be invited. So, I mean, I, I think busy people make time for more activities as well. So, and I think he probably cared a great deal about your grandfather. And what I think one of the amazing things about Cannery Row 
is that it was such a much multicultural community at the turn of the century. The fact that, and you know, Sandy Leiden points this out, that not only were there different um, socioeconomic groups, you know, managers and workers were living on Cannery Row, but also real ethnic diversity on, on Cannery Row. So it must have been in a really exciting place to live. And the fact that he, uh, uh, they brought Christmas presents to uh, my grandfather's children, so that would be to my mom and her uh, brothers and sisters, uh, that they had the time to think about those things for the children too, is very um, uh, poignant to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Don Poor said something, but I don't quite understand it. So Don, you're going to have to unmute yourself and explain your question. Oh, you there? Yeah. Yeah, so another interesting bit of little Cannery Row history is there was a laboratory that was at the base of the Meyer Bay Aquarium called the Hertzstein Laboratory, right? So that was um, Jacques Lurb's laboratory that was donated to him. It was there for about 10, 12 years. And it was there from, well, 1905 to about 1917. Once that was done, the house that is now at Wave Street Studio, it was moved. So the lab building that served as first time lab got moved to that house so it's just another bit of the whole history of what's going on down in cannery row before ricketts and that period of time that stretches back to the early 1900s hmm. and That's I don't know how to raise my hand, so can I add to this a minute? Yes. I, um, I'm a, a docent at the lab, so I know something about the history and so forth. And a couple of things that I wanted to add was uh, one that because Ricketts did not have a degree, it took Stanford almost 12 years to publish Between the Pacific Tides because he didn't have that PhD after his name. And so they were reluctant. And today I understand it's the uh, best selling nonfiction book still that Stanford produces. And the other thing, uh, Susan, I was thinking about this in the beginning um, the reason of, about Doc, that um, he was only, he's called Doc in the book. And he was only allowed to be called Doc by the children because he would treat their impetigo. They'd go before the, um, there was a place for them to go. Uh, when their parents worked in the canneries, they would play in the dirt and they'd get impetigo and he would go into the, they'd knock on the door of the lab and he would give them what it was to cure the impetigo. And so only the children were allowed to call him Doc. And then of course he's Doc in the book. So those are just a few things to add. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thanks for that. That's very nice, yeah. Can I add something, just because you mentioned Steinbeck and before Emily, I know is gonna close, but I wanted to say that the next discussion is um, an historian and then my husband, who's a scientist, joined by two um, Stanford students um, who are zooming in from the East Coast to talk about, um, to kind of enhance the discussion of frogs and other animals in the book. So please, um, please consider that they're, they're working on their presentation for next week. <laughs> so go ahead, Emily. Wonderful, thanks, Susan. Thanks again so much to our presenters, to Greg and to Susan for the wonderful presentations and to the participants for um, your questions and engagement. Um, and just a reminder to register for that talk next week that Susan just mentioned. Um, you can go to the um, Monterey Public Library website. So again, it'll be Jeffrey Dunn presenting and then William Gilley and kind of finishing out the, um, our series of, of presentations and discussions on the book um, next week. So we hope to see you all there. So thanks everybody, have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>